Father, we just want to come before you right now and just thanking you for the freedom that we have from sin, the freedom that we have from physical death, and not just physical death, but spiritual death being separated from you, all because of Christ, the Messiah, our Messiah, our anointed one who has come for us. And so today, I pray that each one of us in this gathering that we lift our hands to you and that we truly do sing, Hosanna, you are my king. And it's in your name we lift up this prayer to Abba Father. Amen. And Aaron, I just want to say thank you so much uh, for the songs this morning that all really revolve around transformation and, and also the scriptures uh, that Dan read, and thank you, Dan, uh, for, the, for the scriptures. Uh, also, just uh, good morning to all of you, and good morning to those that are on Zoom. see several of you, and uh, also those that will be watching later on YouTube. Um, you can go ahead and open up to 1 John. Not going to tell you where, just open up to 1 John. If I tell you where, uh, you'll start looking. And, and trying to figure out, okay, where is he going to be reading at or something like that. So I'm not going to tell you where. Just, just open up to 1 John and I'll give you time uh, to get to the scripture. But in two weeks, we are going to be celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. I mean, we know the day when Jesus was resurrected because of the Jewish calendar and the fact that they followed the Passover and we know that his resurrection took place during the Passover feast. And I started thinking a lot about we, we, we've been going through the chosen out at uh, Galena uh, watching that series. Sherry and I actually went to the theater uh, over the last couple of months, uh, the last month and a half or whatever, and we saw all of season four. They showed the whole thing in, in two-week increments, uh, which it is so, so powerful. Um, and it made me think about everything that Jesus has gone through. And especially this week, 2,000 years ago, leading up to the, to the entrance next Sunday of when Jesus enters Jerusalem for the last time. And everything that transpires. And I started thinking about my life. And I want you to think about your life. Did Jesus go through? Number one, did Jesus leave heaven where he was equal with God, where he was God, is God? Did he leave heaven to come down here and live on this planet where people mocked him, laughed at him, scorned him. Yes, many followed him, but so many people misunderstood him and were constantly badgering him. Did he leave heaven and come down to this earth and then go through everything that he went through when he was put on trial the lies, the beatings, the mocking, making fun of him, spitting on him. And then nailing him to a cross 
with big old spikes through his hands and through his feet. And then to be put in a grave. And then, Resurrection Sunday. When he came out of that grave alive. Yes, amen. Thank you. He was alive. He is alive. This is historical fact. We don't have to wonder if there really was a Jesus. History tells us outside of the Bible that yes, there was a Jesus. We don't have to wonder if he was nailed to a cross. History outside of the Bible tells us that he was nailed to a cross. And that he was put in a tomb. Now, history won't tell you this part. History will not tell you that he's alive today because many of them, they're still looking for his body. They're still looking for the grave. Now, stop and think about this. 2,000 years later, they have scoured the grounds out there trying to find the grave and the body of Jesus Christ, and they have not found it. Why? Why? They haven't looked hard enough? They haven't looked in the right place? Or was he resurrected just like the Bible tells us? So let me ask you something. And I didn't mean to shout. <laughs> David, come on, bro. Did he do all of that for us to stay the same as we have always been? Did he do all of that? As Kay and I were talking, did he do all that just so we could come sit in a church building every Sunday? It's about transformation. I am not yet what the Lord is going to make me and what I will become when I'm resurrected out of this body. And neither are you. It's about transformation. And some of us really need to hear 1 John chapter, and I, I need it, I, so I, I would presume, I know that some of you do because we've had conversations and Bible studies together and different things like that. But in 1 John chapter 1, John, one of the apostles of Jesus, And I don't know. I, I, I was thinking about this when I was going to say something about John. You know, he's the one that John himself said in the gospel that he wrote. And he wrote all of his stuff near the end of his life. He wrote his gospel, matter of fact, probably around uh, A.D. 90. He wrote this one around, uh, around A.D. 90, second and third John. He also wrote Revelation. The letter to the seven churches. And we always talk about, oh, well, John, John writes, well, he's the one that, that, that Jesus loved. And I've always thought about that. Oh, well, he was saying, you know what, hey, uh, Shelly, I'm, I'm, I'm more popular with Jesus than you are. You know what I mean, type thing. And I got to thinking about that. You know, is that really what he was saying? Or was he saying near the end of his life, as he's writing the good news account of Jesus, was he beginning, you know, man, Jesus loved me. Jesus 
loves me. And that's what I want us to see from, from 1 John right here. Because John writes in verse 5, this is the message. This letter he's writing, he goes, this is the message that we heard from Jesus. And we now declare to you. In other words, he's saying, this message that I'm fixing to give you right now, we got this right, I got this right from the mouth of Jesus. It wasn't handed down. I didn't, have, I didn't have Peter come up and tell me about this. This is a message that Jesus himself gave to us, and I'm declaring it to you, that God is light, and there is no darkness in him at all. God is light. There is no darkness. God is pure, unadulterated light. And there is not even a speck of darkness in God. So, verse 6, we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but we go on living in spiritual darkness, we're not practicing the truth. Today, if I were to ask you, are you fellowshipping with God? Would you say yes? Yes, I'm fellowshipping with God. Didn't you hear me singing? I want to take the, 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 the Lord's Supper in a little bit. I'm fellowshipping with God. But what about tomorrow? What about Tuesday? What about Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday? What about later today? Am I letting the Holy Spirit transform me? Or am I coming and am I been just coming to, 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 to church, to the church building? And claiming that I have fellowship with God. But yet, spiritually, I'm living in darkness. I have words that come out of my mouth. whether in profanity-type way or gossip, slander, judging, condemning. I have, I have attitudes inside of me that, that it may not manifest itself in my words or my actions, but boy, I've got some things in my heart that are dark, how I view other people. We talked about that in our Bible study this morning. How does God view people? Yet how do I view people that are different from me or that think different from me or act different from me? Are people that are just flat out in darkness. How do I view these people? What is the attitude in my heart? So am I fellowshipping with God? Or am I living in spiritual darkness? Is the Holy Spirit transforming me? 
You know, I mentioned things like gossip and slander and our words and attitudes and stuff like that. But you know, one of the big things that I find that, that many people struggle with is sexual immorality. Am I fellowshipping with God? But yet, during the week, I'm involved in sexual and moral immorality. See, did Jesus come and do everything that he did and die for your sins and take your sins so that we can have victory over sin, we can have victory over death? so that we could just keep on going the way we've been going, except add in a few little things, like going to church, praying, doing, doing some things here, doing some things there in the name of God. He says if we are, we're not practicing the truth, but if we are living in the light, as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And, and this takes the opposite side of the coin because I believe many of us sometimes, we struggle with our sin. I struggle with my sin. When I sin, I struggle. Hey, I, I may be the only one, but I don't think so. Have, have, have you sinned or, or sometimes you, 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 you do the same sin again and you're just so frustrated and, and you think, oh, you're David, you're so stupid. How could you be that stupid to do that again? You know, you're an idiot. Have you ever called yourself an idiot after you sinned? I have. You're stupid. What, what is wrong with you, boy? And, 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 and it gets me to where I feel like that, that I'm not worthy. I am worthless to God. I am worthless to Jesus. I am worthless to the Holy Spirit. I am worthless for the kingdom. And I want to say to you today, if you're feeling like that, here's something we need to understand because I want us all to understand that God says we will sin even though we are his children. Even though we're walking in the light of Jesus, we will sin. You will sin. I will sin. And I believe some of us as believers that are sitting here right now, we need to know this and go ahead and just take a deep breath because if you're walking after Jesus and you're walking in the light of Jesus guess what you're not going to be perfect neither am I but his blood that he gave on that cross is continuously cleansing me of all sin. Do you see? The, he says, man, you're walking in the light. Well, if I was perfect by walking in the light, I don't need his blood cleansing me from all sin, right? But the fact of the matter is, even though we're walking in the light, his blood is continuously cleansing me of my sin. Church, it's about transformation. as he changes us from the inside out. Um, let me, do, you, do you believe in, do you believe that you belong to Jesus? This morning, right now, do you believe, yes, I belong to to Jesus. Now sometimes, some of you may be thinking, well, that's kind of a weird question. Yeah. You, you know, truth of the matter is, some of us are sitting there, oh yeah, uh, oh yeah, I think London belongs to Jesus. Or Norma. Or Chad. Or Terry. 
deep down inside sometimes I think we wonder yeah I don't I don't know I really don't know look at uh, Romans 5 and I told Aaron I'm gonna keep this under 30 minutes today so I'm gonna have to move And he didn't say anything about me not keeping it under 30 minutes. I just told him that. <laughs> but Romans 5, look at verse 20. In Romans 5, do, do, do you belong to Jesus? Do I belong to Jesus? Verse 20, God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. But as people sinned more and more, God's wonderful grace was, uh, became more abundant. And just as sin ruled over all people and brought them to death, now God's wonderful grace rules instead, giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So, so the, you know, why was the old covenant given? What was the old law given, the Old Testament Betty was telling me she's reading through the Bible now and, and she was in Leviticus. You feel like you can be in quicksand when you start getting in Leviticus, you know, or, or either that or, or wet concrete and then it starts drying on you because, I mean, you can really get bogged down when you start reading all of the different laws and all of the different rules and everything. But you know, we need to understand that the Israelites at this time, God's chosen people, they had been delivered out of slavery. 400 years of slavery. God rescued them in a very miraculous, powerful way. And, and there was no way that they should have missed it. And so when they camped at Mount Sinai for a year, that's when Moses, that's when God gave Moses all of these laws and along with the Ten Commandments. But when you read Leviticus, there's much more than ten. It covers everything. You know why? Because they had been in Egypt, but not just, there had been no law up until that time. God made everyone in his own image, and they had gotten way away from God's image. So God chose this people out of their very evil, dark culture and brought them to a mountain, and he said, okay, here is what I am like. And that's why you read through Leviticus every so often, God will remind them, I am holy. So you be holy. And holy just simply means set apart. God says, I am set apart from any other God that is out there. And there are false gods, which are really no gods at all. But they, they had all of these other gods. So God said, I am holy. I am set apart. So you be set apart from the rest of culture. And I want you to think about something. Do, do you realize that when you look at all of those laws, and Betty, I don't know if you, are you done with Leviticus? You're done, so you're out of it. But if anybody else goes into Leviticus, when you read all of those different laws and commands that God is giving, they fulfill... If, if you can keep all, they will fulfill the two greatest commandments of loving God and loving others. All of them. And loving yourself, as yourself. All of them. That's, that's what all of them deal with. They're, they're not some kind of weird stuff. When you really begin to look at those, every single one of them will help you to love God more. All of the different sacrifices, all of the different things that they were told to do, and, and this day and that day, and all of those were to draw them to God, to look at God so that they would love God more. And then as they loved God more, how they treated one another. All of them. So the law was given so that they could see how sinful they were. 
We can look and see how sinful we are. When I look at a holy God, I'm going to tell you something, folks. I need a Savior. Amen? I need a Savior. And as people sinned more and more, it's not that they were sinning more and more than they were in previous generations. It's just the fact that they realized that they were sinning more and more because now they knew that, hey, here is what God is like and here is how I am so unlike Him. But He said, His grace is greater than your sin. His grace is greater than your sin, my sin, our sin. Where our sins sometimes accelerate, His grace super accelerates. Andrea, His grace covers all of our sin. I raise a hallelujah, amen? I need to really get moving. Chapter 6, Romans. Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of His wonderful grace? You know, there are, there are religions and even denominations that actually practice this. It doesn't matter how I live my life during the week. All I got to do is just go and confess it to God and His grace is going to cover me. Maybe some of us are sitting here right now today and, and, and we're thinking, wow, you know, man, His grace is greater than my sin, so does it really matter? Well, to that question, Paul is emphatic, and he goes, of course not. Of course you don't keep on sinning. Why? Because have you forgotten that when you were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, that we joined Him in His death? See, God has given us a very tangible way to experience the death of Christ. And it's called baptism. Baptism is not something we do for God. And I think for a long time, we in our churches, we've gotten it so backwards. This is something I do for God. If I do this for God, then, man, I get brownie points, and, and, and he's going to give me my, my you know, free pass out of hell into heaven. Baptism is a gift that God gives us in a very tangible way to experience the death of Christ and to join him in that death because he says since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Transformation. How in the world, if, if we have died to sin, if we are dead to sin, how in the world can we be alive in sin? Alive to sin. We have died to it, right? For we died in verse 4, and we were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. When we were baptized, when you were baptized, and we need to be reminded of this because it's easy for us to get off track. But he said, we died. We, we died. You died. 
You die to yourself. You die to this world. You die to your sinful nature. We die and we're buried with Christ by baptism. Baptism. That's why it is a burial. That's what the word baptize means. It means to dip, to plunge, to immerse, to bury. It's not sprinkling. It's not taking a pitcher of water and pouring it over someone's head. Again, it's not about splitting hairs. But it's a burial because it's God's gift to you. Do we understand that inside of this baptistry, and I've always said this, inside of this baptistry, it is just simple H2O, just plain old tap water out of the faucet. There's nothing magical about it. There's nothing special about it. But what becomes special and miraculous about it is when we obey God. God has given us a gift to experience the death and the resurrection of Jesus so that we can experience transformation in our lives and no longer be a slave to sin. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. The same power that God exerted to raise Jesus out of that tomb. Guess what happens when we're buried in baptism? That's the same power that he exerts in your life and in my life so that we can live by that glorious power. Eric, that glorious power is for you today. It's for me today. It's for us today. Do we live like it? Do I live like it? And I had a couple other passages I was going to read, but I'm not going to do that, so I'm going to finish out here in Romans a little bit for about four or five minutes at the most. He said, since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ. I need to understand, when I gave my life to Jesus and I was buried with him in baptism, experienced his death, experienced his resurrection by by the glorious power of, of God, I have been crucified with Christ. Why? So that sin might lose its power in our lives. Are you struggling with sin in your life right now? Am I trying to handle it by myself? Or am I remembering what Jesus has done for me on that cross and experience that in my burial, in my death, in baptism? Experiencing God's glorious power that gives me new life. Am I walking in the light? We are no longer slaves at the end of verse 6. We are no longer slaves to sin. Why? For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know that we will also live with Him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead and He will never die again. And I love that. Because if you remember, just a few weeks before Jesus went into Jerusalem, he stopped by Mary, Martha, and the tomb of Lazarus because his friend Lazarus had died. And Martha came running out to Jesus and and was like, Ah, man, if you'd been here, Jesus, my brother wouldn't have died. Where were you? 
And that's when, and that's when Jesus told Martha, man, I'm the resurrection, I'm the life. Anyone who lives, who believes in me, will never, ever die. That's what he tells her in John 11. That, that verse has brought me so much comfort as I think about right now my daddy. Sherry was just asking me on the way over. My mom's 92. She was asking me, you know, as your mom said, uh, what, what she wants, how she wants her funeral. You know, I, I, I said, no. And she goes, well, you need to get on it, you know. I don't think my mom really cares too much about it at this point because, I mean, you talk about a Jesus follower. She knows that she's never, ever going to die. You don't know what kind of comfort that gives me, and I hope he gives you for your loved ones who have known the Lord because Jesus never, ever died. Our loved ones will never, ever die. They would just simply leave this old tent right here. Hallelujah for that, right? Leave this old tent, and we'll receive, when Jesus comes back, we'll receive a permanent Body, a brand new body, a brand that will be a house. That's what he says in 2 Corinthians 5. It will be a house. It will be permanent. Our spirits will have a brand new body. Me. For all eternity. Living on the new earth and new heaven that he's going to give us. For all eternity. With him as the light. We won't need sunshine. We won't need the moon, stars, or anything else. He is its light. That's what he tells us in Revelation. So when he died, verse 10, he died once to break the power of sin, but now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. Jesus, right now, is living for the glory of God. How about you? Are you living for the glory of God? Oh yeah, you're going to sin. You're going to mess up. You're going to think bad thoughts. You're going to have bad attitudes at times. But are you walking in the light of Jesus? Are you walking with Him? His blood continuously cleanses you from all sin. We're going to take